uh, please bear with them uh, as, uh, as they, they, they really pull that together. Thank you so very much. Uh, so, uh, if you don't know me, I'm Manuel. I'm coming from Montreal, and I'm very glad to be here. Before I start, everybody has that? You don't have that? Do you have that? You have to pick one from the entrance. You didn't? Okay, it's going to be distributed. Well, you get one of those. Um, I just want to, um, since we're still in January, um, just want to, uh, to wish you a, a Happy New Year. A year... Oops, did I do something wrong? Okay, so I, I wish you a Happy New Year, a, a year that will be full of growth, uh, full of uh, spiritual growth, so that you could end the year stronger than you started. That's what I, I, I wish for you and, uh, and also send you all the greetings from the Montreal Church. Uh, so this morning we're going to talk about God's power. And is there, just before I start, is there anybody who is allergic to the Old Testament? <laughs> no, because we're going to spend a lot of time in it. So... Uh, <laughs> At least you're not allergic to it. So that's good. So when you can turn to Exodus 19, but when I say God's power, what comes to your mind? Nothing comes to your mind when I say God's power. I mean, that's scary. The universe, God's creation. Creating of the universe. Charles. Exodus from, from, from Egypt. Yes, Donna. Jesus, Jesus raised from the dead. Benito. Forgiveness. Sorry? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Okay. A lot of things come to mind. I'm going to look at something, um, some examples. And in Exodus 19, the context is that, talking about the Exodus, uh, God had made a lot of miracles in Egypt to really convince Pharaoh to let his people go. Finally, after 10 plagues, he let them go. And off they go, a million plus people just walking in the desert, uh, going towards the promised land. And two months after they left, this is what's happening. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speak with you and will always put their trust in you. So we need to realize, if you put ourselves in the, in the condition, even today, when God says, okay, I'm going to come and appear to you, it catches your attention, especially since you know everything that is done. It's been just two months since he did all this plague, all those frogs and things running everywhere and death and, and destructions and firstborn being killed, and then saying, I'm going to appear to you. So he's catching the attention. And then in verse 12, it says, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So it, it took them three days. It's just get ready. I'm coming. Three days to get ready. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. This is dangerous ground, kind of warning, be careful, dangerous, do not touch, death. And the day of, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning. I mean, we know the storms here, that got a big thunderstorm and then the lightning that comes with it, with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Do you think that somebody in the audience was blowing the trumpet? No. no. It's just, you there, you're coming, you have a million plus people around the mountain, and then that is, it's been three days, 
that you're there, say he's coming, and then you see the lightning, and then the thunder, and then you hear that trumpet blasting, you don't know from where, I mean, most likely from the mountain coming, everybody in the camp trembled. I'm pretty sure it was pretty silence here, just except for the blast of the trumpet and the lightning that was striking. Everybody trembled. 18, verse 18, 19. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. You can picture this. You can have that mountain. You already have all the clouds and everything in the smoke. And then you see the fire coming down. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. And the whole mountain trembled violently. It didn't shake a little bit trembled violently. Have you already seen a mountain tremble violently? It's pretty impressive as I can imagine it, right? Especially as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. I'm pretty sure nobody crossed that line that was on the ground, right? Nobody was pushing to move forward. Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. Wow. Wow. To just imagine what's happening there. I mean, among a, a million people, I don't know how many fainted, but I would be surprised if nobody fainted. If nobody even had heart attacks, maybe. It's kind of all of a sudden that trumpet that sounds, I mean, you don't know what to expect. It's the first time you're going to actually see God saying, I'm coming. If that's the power of God just coming. And in Exodus 24, continue, he says, to the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. A consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up the mountain. I don't know, but I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know if I really want to be Moses, you know? I mean, it's pretty, it's a privilege. It's a privilege, right? It's kind of, God is telling you, you can come. So, yes, I, I think that it could come, but regardless, I mean, even if there's a net there and then there's a 30, 30 feet hole and I say, jump, it's safe, right? There's a big net there. I don't know. I, I, would, I don't know. There's something that would have happened and, for Moses. And, and you can imagine how scary that must have been for the people, but also for Moses. And that's what, that what it was to come in the presence of God. How do you feel today about coming in the presence of God? Right? slight difference, you'd say, right? Between you approaching the presence of God today and Moses and the people approaching the presence of God. The thing is that in our days, we tend to approach things like, you know, of course God wants me. He wants to have a relationship with me. That's what we tell everybody. We meet everybody, we meet somebody in the street, reach out to them and say, yeah, God wants a relationship with you, right? And that's true. But we might have pushed it a little bit too far because the Bible doesn't show us exactly that approach to it. What, what's your favorite book in the Bible? Romans, John, Proverbs, Revelations. Okay. Anybody has Leviticus in the top three? <laughs> Nobody. Yeah, that's not a surprise. That's not a surprise. It, it, when we think Leviticus, we think boring. We think rules. We think things to do. We think, we think it's boring. But if we look at why did we put Leviticus, why did God put Leviticus there? There's a reason why he put it there, and for several reasons. But, and I don't, I don't think I know all of them, but just one of them is to explain to us a little bit 
God's point of view as opposed to our point of view. The point is not is if God wants a relationship with us. The point is we want a relationship with him because we, we have to benefit from it. And how or will God allow us to come into his presence? That's the real point. And that's why he put Leviticus in there. Because it is a big deal to come in God's presence. And as an illustration, let's look at Leviticus 10, 1 to 3. Aaron's sons, Aaron's high priest, remember? Don't need to context. Okay. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. Bam! There was no, oh, um, I'll count to three, and then if you're still there, no, you did something unauthorized, contrary to my command, the fire comes and bam, you, you, you're gone, you're consumed, and you die. That's what happened. So Moses has to explain and say, Moses said to Aaron, who just lost his two sons, obviously, because they just went unauthorized before the presence, in the presence of the Lord, he said, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all people, I will be honored. That is the God who is saying, listen to what I'm saying. I, I, I want a relationship with you. Well, yeah, okay. But we need to make sure that you make it and you can handle my presence. And if you consider that this is not a big deal, say, yeah, what well, a big deal. It's just I put incense on the fire and then I'll go in and offer a sacrifice and we'll be good, right? No, we're not. And he gave a very precise instructions. Let's look a little bit at those instructions. No instructions. Okay, so I don't know why it's not working. Hmm? Oh, perfect. So, first, you take a young bull for sin offering and for his own sin. We're talking about the one who's going to enter the holy and holy. Then you take a ram for the burnt offering. Then you need to wear the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarment. You need to tie the linen shafts. You need to put on linen turban. Still following? Oh, you need to bathe before. You take two male goats for sin offering for the sin of the people. Then you take another ram for burnt offering. Then you take two hands full of finely ground fragrant put on burning coals. Then you sprinkle the bull's blood seven times before the atonement cover. Then you sprinkle the goat's blood seven times before the atonement cover. Then you sprinkle the bull's blood several times before the tent of meeting. Then you sprinkle the goat's blood seven times before the tent of meeting. Then you sprinkle the bloods, the bull's blood seven times on the altar. Then you sprinkle the goat's blood seven times on the altar. You still following me? Yeah. Then you can confess the sin of the people over the live goat out of the two, the one who survived. Then you send the live goat into the wilderness. Then you remove the linen garment. You take another bath and you put your regular clothes. You come out and sacrifice the burnt offering for yourself and for the people. Then you burn the fat of the sin offering. That's for one person to come in the presence of God. One person. That's a lot of time to do. That's a lot of time to prepare. You can imagine the high priest, especially since if it's Aaron, his two sons already died from doing this wrong. 
the day before he has to do that. Did he, he put some thought into it? He will put a lot of thought into it. It's kind of, whoa, I need to do this right. It, it gives him time to prepare his heart. So there's some, some value in it. And all those procedures, this is a little bit overwhelming. And then I, the image that comes to me when I think of it is more than that. Is this. It's dangerous. It's radioactive. It's like you have to go into a room and you know those movies where there's some whatever this is that you don't know how it's transmitted, right? You know if it's airborne or whatever. You know it's in that room and you know to, you need to go to that room to get the key to whatever, save the world. And then all the things that you have to put all the protection that you have to make because you know that in that room there's something that your body cannot handle. Your body cannot handle God's presence. He cannot. You will die. You will be consumed. And that's why you say, okay, make sure you do this right. Because if you don't, you don't have a second chance. As I said, there's no, okay, I count to three. You don't have a second chance. You're gone finish. It's dangerous. And in the time, what happened is that when the high priest was doing that, because we never know what step he might have missed, they tie a rope on his ankle. Just so that at the end of the day, if he's not back, we need to bring him out, right? But nobody can go in because you need to go through the same procedure and you're not consecrated. So how do we get him back? At least the rope is there we can pull him out. That's the presence. That's the power of God. That's the God that we worship. That's the presence that we cannot stand unless there are some sort of protective measures that are put in place for us to be, to, to be able to handle it. And we don't do that today. Thank you, Lord. You don't have to do it. And as you said, Jesus. Because Jesus did. Because Jesus is kind of, it's as if he's putting his blood to coat us. And then we're covered from head to toes. And then we can enter free. We're clean. And the thing is that the God of the Old Testament do you think he's different from the God from the New Testament? He's not. He's the same. In Malachi 3, 6, it says, For I, the Lord, do not change. It's very straightforward. In English, in French, any language, I do not change. Same God, same respect is required. And because of, or oh, thanks to the blood of Jesus, it says in Hebrews 10, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy by the blood of Jesus. So this is telling us that because of the blood of Jesus, we have confidence we can enter the presence of that God who is dangerous. You see, it says confidence, confidently. It didn't say casually. It starts with C, but it's not the same meaning at all. Yet, I'm wondering how casual we are in approaching the presence of God. Whether it's in communion or in your quiet times, you're approaching the presence of God and then we're casual about it. We lost that reverence that makes us realize, hey, uh, warning here, it's dangerous. And don't feel too bad. Hopefully you feel bad about it, but not too bad. The, the Israelites, as I said, two months after they left Egypt, they were facing that, wow, God came in the cloud, the fire, the thunder, the trumpets, the, the mountain violently trembling, and Moses going in. Wow, everybody's waiting, expecting what's going to happen. And then they lost their reverence too, even after all this display of might and power. 
How long did it take them to lose that reverence? How long? In, Mo in Exodus 24, Moses entered the cloud and went up the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, mix us gods who will go before us. You look at that and it's very easy to be judgmental. I say, what's wrong with you people? I mean, what else can he do? It's, it's calling on all your senses. Your smell, your sight, your touch, your everything is shaking. Yet, 40 days after Moses went up there to talk with God, you're already building yourself your man-made God of, of gold and who doesn't move, who is there because you put it this way. If you put it this way, it's going to still be that way. It's kind of what type of God is this? It's very easy to be judgmental, but let's revert back. We lost our reverence too. When we don't even, ah, oh, this morning I don't feel like waking up to read my Bible or talk to God, and I can talk to him anytime anyway, right? That's what he said. Just, as soon as I'm called a brother, two or three of us are here, he's there, that's fine. No, same God. Reverence, respect, please. And if you have that sticker, it's to, to just to help you remember God is dangerous. God is powerful. So I don't know where you need to put it. Where is, I mean, now you have, a, you have all your, your Bibles on your phone and stuff like that, so don't put it on the screen uh, <laughs> if you use your, your phone to read your Bible in the morning. But... Put it where you have your quiet times in the morning. Put it in your songbook. Put it in a place where you go regularly to have your, your quiet time or you come in the presence of God. Just as a reminder, this is a powerful God. This is a mighty God. We cannot handle his presence unless we have that protection. So let's not take it for granted that we can approach him. So, now, the question is, this power is there. How can we tap into it? How can we access that power? It would be great to access it, right? Be able to channel it, to use it. And with that type of, of power, there's nothing we cannot do. There's nothing we cannot do. He created the, the examples that you gave. He created the universe. If he created the universe, you think he can take care of your problem? Of course he can. He can change everything. If, if you're born that day, it's because he decided it. If you're in Ottawa today, it's because he decided it. So he can work out everything and anything. And how can we plug into it? It's like Christmas just went by. So imagine that you have a, a five-year-old, and then you gave him a tablet for Christmas. Okay? And then he's playing with it, and then he's, oh, what's this? What's that? Oh, okay. He's, what, what's this on the top right corner, mom or dad? Oh, that, that's the, 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 battery, um, the battery reader. They, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, it's cool. It was 100 yesterday, today is 80. Okay, cool. Keeps playing, and, uh, and say, later on, kid comes and say, uh, Mom, I don't know what's happening. Siri, Siri's talking. Siri's talking. She, she's saying that, that it's 20%. I, I, do I need to close some app? So, so what do I do? Uh, okay. It, it's saying that. So, okay. But I keep playing. keep playing my game. 5%, the app's closed. And then the screen goes black on the tablet. And say, Mom, can I have another one? This one is broken. <laughs> it doesn't work. Look, I shook it. It's, uh, it doesn't work. I, it, I pressed all the buttons. It doesn't work. What would you answer? 
So they say, um, can I make a suggestion? What about you plug it to the power? Yeah, let's try that. Let's give that a try. That's exactly how God feels when you're coming, kind of moving in all the different circles and agitated as you could be with your problems, trying to go and right, left, and center to get it fixed. When he's saying, um, are you ready to listen? I have a suggestion. You know what the suggestion is? Plug into God. That's what he's saying. That's how God sees the thing. He says, I can do it. I, I, I can guarantee you if you plug it, it will charge the battery. It will work. It will charge your spiritual battery. And God is saying, try me. Try that. I know you press all the buttons. You threw it on the wall, it bounced back because you had the protective cover. That's good, but it didn't make it work. What worked is that you plug it in. And we're going to look at a couple of examples, still in the Old Testament, of people who plugged it in. And it's two kings, two, uh, father and son, in, uh, in Second Chronicles. Uh, it's King Asa and Jehoshaphat. And let's read in uh, Second Chronicles 14. King Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, his God. He removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and commands. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. It worked. He built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace. No one was at war with him during those years, for the Lord gave him rest. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, next, sorry. So, just a pause there. What happened is that somebody tried to attack. Powerful army tried to attack Ethiopians. Then Asa, who had an army, he had 300 men plus uh, 280,000 men um, who was uh, uh, there to, to, to ready to fight. So he had an army with him, but he said, he called unto the Lord and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name, we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere mortals prevail against you. What did the Lord do? He struck down the Kishites before he signed Judah, and that was it. They plugged in. He, first of all, did what was right in the, in the middle of the world, right? He, he worshipped. He, that, that's the plugging part. Plugging part entailed removing all the other idols or whatever. You remove everything that's in the hole there that prevents the plugging from happening. You, you clean that up, and then you plug God in. And it worked. And the thing is that they didn't have the Bible at the time. They had the Word. They had some scrolls, but it's not, it wasn't accessible the way it is today. They didn't have the Holy Spirit in them as we do, as we receive it, as we receive him at the, the, the day of baptism, right? Yet, they did, they trusted in God and not in their own strength. And if we continue the story, in 2 Chronicles 15, we see that Asa continued to do the right thing. Uh, his grandmother is acting up, setting up idols everywhere and stuff like that. He removed her. He really does what's good in the eyes of the Lord. And then, I don't know why, Maybe somebody could explain it to me. I didn't study it in depth enough, probably. But 2 Chronicles 16, Asa changes his, uh, his approach. He went and made a treaty with Ben-Hadad, another powerful king in the area, to make an alliance with that wicked king. And 
he paid him for protection. He said, look, every, this wealth that I have, I could give it to you if, we just, if you, you protect me so that I would remain protected. Hanani, a, a prophet at the time, went and told him, how are you doing? What are you doing? You had the perfect plug, perfect power, and then you went to look for, for another one, a different one. It's as if you went and then on your tablet, you put an external battery. You know those external batteries that you buy for, for your phone so that if it dies, then you have a little bit of power left? That gave him peace, gave him peace for a little bit, but that was temporary. It went away. And then what happened in the end is that destruction came. And he did poor things because he wasn't connected to the true source. He ended up being sick. And instead, again, on going to God and asking God for help, he went to seek help somewhere else, doctors or whatever. He ended up dying. So he started well. He did great things, Asa. It didn't end well for him because he unplugged. When he was plugged, that's so awesome. Keep remain plugged. No, he went to get an external battery. It's more convenient. I can go there and there with it. This external battery is not asking me to remain close to the source, right? As opposed to God, it says, hey, remain plugged because you need to remain close. With this external battery thing, you can go over there, but you might not come back from over there. That's the problem. And when we look at his son, he says, ah, I'm not doing the same thing. I'm going to follow what God wants me to do. And in 2 Chronicles 20, uh, we see that it's Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. Verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. That's the plugging that we're talking about. For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. We plug into the source. We don't know what to do, but we have one thing right. Our eyes are on you. Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who you live in Judah and, and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. The battle is not yours but God's. That's the problem. We want to make it our battle. This is not our battle. And that's why we can't win it. It's not ours. It's God's battle. And the prophet continues to talk to Jehoshaphat on behalf of God. He said, tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the gorge of the desert of Jeruel. It's kind of, okay, you know what? I'm giving you clear instructions. This is the way that they're coming. They're coming from that path there. Go. You will not have to fight this battle. Where was I? You will not have to fight the battle, right? <laughs> you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. And Joseph just, just does that. He obeys. He understands that 
the battle is not mine. This vast army might be scary, but my God is scarier, as we've seen it. My God is more powerful. My God is the one who rules over the nations. And in verse 20, it's pretty amazing. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith. Translation? Plug in. In the Lord your God. And you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets. And you will be successful. After consulting the people, Joseph had appointed men to sing the Lord and, the, and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord and for his love and Jews forever. That's why I asked the change of song. So picture this, though. By far, coming from there. They are dangerous. They just want to rip you apart. Jehoshaphat, king of the army, is appointing the quartet to be in front and to march in front of the army to go face the enemy. I mean, I'm pretty sure that criticism existed at the time. In the army of 200,000 or 500,000 or however many they are, maybe not in the front row, but a little bit further down, I'm pretty sure some soldiers were, what is Joseph thinking? <laughs> we're going to battle against this army, and then he takes the quartet and put them front line. What is he thinking? What, what, what stupid plan is that? I'm so glad I didn't sign up for quarter this year. It's just, I'm so glad because I will be front line naked going to this battle. This is a plan that does not make sense in our own words. Because from the Bible point of view, from, the God, from God's point of view, it makes sense. That's why we're reading our Bible every day. It's not because we already know. We are a way of thinking, and we're using the Bible to think God's way. What God is saying here, God is saying victory is sure. It hasn't happened yet, but it's sure. And therefore, you're going, His love and you forever, before you even go in battle, you're singing so loud that His love. They hear you coming. His love and Jews forever. Oh, that's a carnival. They're coming to face us. And just, they're just across the, 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 the mountain there. And we're going to go face and, and go to battle. What do you hear? They're singing uh, of joy. It's not the, 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 war, um, the war songs that you're singing. You're singing, give thanks to the Lord. His love and Jews forever. And what happens when you plug in? As they were, as they began to sing and praise, as they begin to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. And he says a little bit further, they arrived and they only saw dead bodies. I don't know what had happened. Maybe they were mixed of groups together were attacking and then one said something um, I was in the communion that was offending the culture of the other one and then he turned and then he cut his throat and whatever and they started a fight and then they all killed each other. I don't know what happened. What I know is that the people of God had faith. We were singing. We won. They arrived and there was no opposition. They had won and they could go and plunder all those countries. That's what happened when you have the power of 
God and you plug into it. But it requires the faith to do that. When was the last time you went into something difficult singing, yeah, I won already. God, it's not my battle. You won it for me already. I'm just going and rejoicing. You go into that interview or whatever the, the case may be, and that's the right thing. And then, you know, fighting for you and the opposition that you, you're getting from, from coworkers or people in the streets or wherever, that's their problem. The other one being ambushed by God. I don't want to be ambushed by God. I'd rather sing His love and just forever, right? And, but, bottom line, at the end, it, it, what, what matters really is that we need to realize how powerful God is, that he can do all that, and then that, that this is available to us. But we need to be careful not to take it casually, right? In Montreal, what we do with that, with those kind of realizing that, and we, we change the format of our services to help us bring everybody to this sense of reverence, that you're going to approach that mountain there. Just, you kind of take it lightly. So what we did is that we start one song, message. And then song, break for, to bring the kids in kids class. And then we have the second part. It's all songs and prayers and reading of psalms and worship. That matters. It's not, oh, we're already three songs in and I'm still chatting to my neighbor. No, this is the singing, remember? The singing is you, you, you front line to the battle, right? So you cannot, that's part of the worship. The worship of a God who is making the mountain tremble violently, coming down in fire. And then that if you do something not according to what you're supposed to do for your own protection, you're gone. That's the type of God. So we need to have the reverence. So we need to, to put some mental reminders for that. That's why I gave you this sticker. Put it where it matters, where you see it when in the morning when you wake up. Say, I'm about to enter in the presence of God. Let me prepare myself. Don't take three days to prepare yourself because it defeats the purpose of the morning quiet time. But prepare yourself for it. Right? And so we, th that's what we're doing to help the congregation, the church, to really realize that that's what we need to do. We need to be focused on who we're worshiping and be careful not to take it too casually. So in conclusion, God is powerful and mighty. You know that. I'm pretty sure that you, I see, you all have stories of things that say, wow, now I see it. I see how God put this and that and that together so that in the end, this is the way it worked. It's just at times I couldn't see it, but now it's so obvious to me. Or even some cases where I say, you know what? I don't know what happened there. And I will only know when I'll get to heaven and I'll ask him. Maybe that's what it's going to take. I don't know. He doesn't owe us anything, right? So he doesn't owe us an answer to our questions. But he's powerful and mighty. And that power demands respect demands reverence. And what's great is that through Jesus, it's available to us. We can tap into that power. We can plug, but it takes some faith. And personally, I pray for the day where I won't need faith anymore. Because that means that I'll be in heaven, I'll be seeing him. So I won't need faith that, to believe in something that I don't see. I will be able to see him and I say, oh, I don't need faith anymore. But we're not there yet, right? So this world is not our home. And while we're getting there, we need that faith to understand and believe that we can tap into this great power that our God has. I hope that helps. And thank you for your time.